strong, charismatic leader. He was the revolution. He was the army. He is the only American who's ever lived who, if he had chosen to, could have become king. There was a movement toward the end of the revolution to make him the king of the new country. Though I am truly sensible of the high honor done me in this appointment, yet I feel great distress from a consciousness that my abilities and military experience may not be equal to the extensive and important trust. However, as the Congress desire, I will enter upon the momentous duty and exert every power I possess in their service and for the support of the glorious cause. George Washington to the Continental Congress. He was a man who had presence. He just walked into a room and everyone stopped and looked at him. He was very tall for, the, for that day, about six feet three, but in that time that made him a giant. George Washington was one of the richest men in America. He owned thousands and thousands of acres in Virginia, which he had in part acquired when he married Martha Custis, who was the richest widow in Virginia at the time uh, of their marriage. And he had inherited a very substantial estate from his brother Lawrence at Mount Vernon. And also he owned thousands of acres in the West, which he had acquired as bounties for his service in the French and Indian War. And it only proves, I think, that the American Revolution was unique in this respect. It wasn't in any sense an attempt to overturn the existing class structure. It was really a war fought to protect rights and privileges and property which Americans felt they possessed as a freeborn Englishman. At his Mount Vernon home, Washington presided over an estate that sheltered and utilized the labors of over 300 hired workers and slaves. He was a tough character. He, he, he wasn't this old man on a dollar bill that we think of now. He stood as straight as an Indian, you know, and men just worshipped him. He drank and he liked to gamble and play cards, and he could, when he got mad, he could cuss the paint off the walls. You have prepared me to entertain a favorable opinion of him, but I thought the one half was not told me. Dignity with ease and complacency. The gentleman and the soldier look agreeably blended in him. Modesty marks every line and feature in his face. Abigail Adams on meeting George Washington. Everyone said he was extraordinarily graceful, the best horseman of the day. He was powerful. He inherited his father's strength. He didn't speak a lot. He was very self-effacing for two reasons. One, that was just his personality. He was not a, a pushy person. The other is his teeth were very bad. Even as a young man, they were rotting out. And that always embarrassed him a little, so he kept his mouth shut. You see the paintings of him with his lips clenched together. My dearest, I am now set down to write you on a subject that fills me with inexpressible concern. It has been determined in Congress that the whole army raised for the defense of the American cause shall be put under my care and that it is necessary for me to proceed immediately to Boston to take up command of it. George Washington to his wife, Martha. Two weeks after the Battle of Bunker Hill, Washington rode to Cambridge and officially took command of the Continental Army. He kept the British trapped in Boston and its harbor for months while he watched his new army, largely composed of independent and undisciplined state militiamen, dwindle by desertions and enlistment expirations. Such a dearth of public spirit and want of virtue, such a dirty mercenary spirit pervades the whole that I should not at all be surprised at any disaster that may happen. Could I have foreseen what I have and am likely to experience? No consideration upon earth should have induced me to accept this command. George Washington, October 29th, 1775. Nevertheless, enough old militia re-enlisted and enough new militia appeared in the next months to hold the shoestring army together. Washington moved his forces onto the heights of the Dorchester Peninsula. 
where he could overlook the British, but he could not threaten them. He had no heavy artillery. You can't begin to imagine the first three years of the war, 1775, 76, 77, without thinking of the two great heroes, the two men who between them kept that war alive, George Washington and Benedict Arnold. Both were great warriors, both were magnificent motivators of soldiers, both had physical courage on the battlefield, both did great things, Benedict Arnold is one of the great enigmas in American history. The reason his treason was so traumatic is because he was such a great hero. In May of 1775, Benedict Arnold, a successful Connecticut merchant whose name is now synonymous with traitor, had a plan that would supply the Patriots with the cannon and munitions they desperately needed. Far up the Hudson River, on the southern end of Lake Champlain lay a dilapidated, undermanned British fort from the French and Indian War, known as Ticonderoga. Arnold persuaded the Massachusetts Committee of Safety to allow him to take up to 400 men to Ticonderoga with the intent of capturing it and its scores of heavy cannon. On the way to do this, he discovered that Ethan Allen was going there on his own so he went ahead, just himself and one person, and joined Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen was a frontier giant and vigilante who commanded the hills of Vermont with his Green Mountain Boys. Hartford, Connecticut citizens commissioned him and his cohorts as the perfect guerrilla force to take the fort. Arnold and Allen didn't get along at all. They fought. They, they didn't like each other personally. They disagreed over who was in charge, and it was confusing. To take Ticonderoga, as it turned out, was a piece of cake. The British defending it hadn't heard about the fighting in Lexington and Concord. So except for one guard, they were all asleep. By the time the alarm was spread, the Americans were inside the fort. They had, uh, at Bayonet Point, all the British, and they surrendered it. No loss at all. The fort was now in American hands. But the transport of the cannon to Boston would require the vision and perseverance of a 280-pound Boston bookseller, Henry Knox. Although he had gained his knowledge of weapons entirely from books, Washington was enough impressed with his mind to make him commander of artillery. I have made 42 exceeding strong sleds and have provided 80 yokes of oxen to draw them. I hope in 16 or 17 days' time to present Your Excellency a noble train of artillery. Henry Knox to Washington. In a legendary feat, the fat bookseller dragged more than 50 cannon through wintry New England mountains to their destination in Boston. Now Washington had his big guns. Once Washington got his hands on these cannon from Fort Ticonderoga, he was ready to act. And in the dark of the night, he emplaced a substantial number of them on the Dorchester Peninsula. And the British awoke one morning, and they stared up, and here were these guns ready to fire right down their throats. The rebels have done more in one night than my whole army could do in months. General William Howe, upon viewing Dorchester Heights. In mid-March, 1776, Less than two weeks after the guns of Ticonderoga appeared atop Dorchester Heights, the British set sail for Halifax, Nova Scotia, taking a thousand Boston loyalists with them. And the Americans then celebrated this as a stupendous victory, which it wasn't. It was a completely illusory victory. They didn't kill a single British soldier. They did get Boston back, but the whole British army had gotten away to fight another day, and they did indeed come back and fight another day as a great, great, big British army. Because 13 colonies became independent, there's a sort of sense of inevitability as though the modern United States was an actual unit. Actually, what's really happened was the partition of British America. Um, the rebels expected 
that their future state would include not merely the 13 colonies, but also Canada, Newfoundland, Labrador, and the West Indies. With the allegiance of 13 colonies, the rebels decided in late 1775 to try for a 14th, Canada, the frozen giant to the north. In September of 1775, General George Washington commissioned one of the heroes of Ticonderoga, Benedict Arnold, to travel to Canada through Maine with 1,100 troops and take the fortress city of Quebec. You are entrusted with the command of the utmost consequence to the liberties of America. Upon your conduct and courage, and that of the officers and soldiers detached on this expedition, not only the success of the present enterprise and your own honor, but the safety and welfare of the whole continent may depend. George Washington. Arnold would be part of a two-pronged attack. General Philip Schuyler and General Richard Montgomery would lead a force of 1,200 men from Fort Ticonderoga to Montreal, then push down the St. Lawrence to meet Arnold at Quebec. Though Montgomery's approach would prove to be difficult and dangerous, Arnold's march through the Maine wilderness would be epic. They sailed to the mouth of Maine's Kennebec River from a port near Boston. This was the true start of the 385-mile wilderness trek to Quebec. Arnold's march to Quebec is truly one of those great dramas of the revolution. It, it has to go down in history as one of the great feats of leadership on one hand and the overcoming of tremendous obstacles and, and the, the willingness to accept great privation and pain even starvation on the part of the people who went along with him. They pushed up the Kennebec in rough 200-pound bateaus, which had to be portaged around the river's many waterfalls. You would have taken the men for amphibious animals, as they were a great part of the time underwater. Benedict Arnold. Breaking trail for Arnold was Daniel Morgan, portrayed here as an old man. At the time of the trek, he was in fact a 39-year-old, tough, wily frontier giant who had lost all the teeth on one side of his mouth when an Indian bullet passed through his neck 17 years earlier. Morgan commanded three companies of riflemen for Arnold's expedition. By the end of October, the northern winter was upon them and their supplies had run out. The voracious disposition many of us had now arrived at rendered almost anything admissible. In the company was a poor dog who became a prey for the sustenance of the assassinators. This poor animal was instantly devoured without leaving any vestige of the sacrifice. Nor did the shaving soap, lip salve, leather of their shoes, cartridge boxes, etc., share any better fate. Dr. Isaac Center. Half of them or more didn't make it. They died along the way of disease or starvation, or they gave up and went back. The others struggled on past the headwaters of the Kennebec toward Canada's Chaudière River. They wade through the mire to the foot of the next steep and gaze up at its summit, contemplating what they must suffer before they reach it. They attempt it, catching at every twig and shrub they can lay hold of. Their feet fly from them. They fall down to rise no more. Private George Morrison. But for Arnold's own personal leadership and his own endurance, uh, they may not have made it. As this entire group was about to freeze to death, to, to die of exposure, he 
and a few hand-picked men raced on ahead.